name is Leela Weinrob and I'm the director of Shakedown. It's about that first image when you walk out. If you come out fierce, that's what they think about. That's what turns them on. But once you start taking off pieces, there's nothing to even think about. Everything is open to open. Wow, that's that? Okay. Next. See, that's the turn on right there. When you first come out, that's the turn on. To any man or any woman, when they first see you, that's the turn on right there. Once you're naked, there's no turn on right there. I want you to make me horny, but then I want you to make me wonder. With some girls, you know, it makes you horny. Some girls, you just say, oh, she's pretty. I like the way she dances. So the strippers really came from the 50s, was really just walking around, sex is swinging the board. It wasn't all that bending and leg popping and coochie popping. That only came like in the 90s. And you know, if you're dancing for guys, it doesn't matter how you look or how you dress. It doesn't matter to them. But when you're dancing for a woman, you have to have that feminine and you have to dress accordingly with the right kind of clothes and heels. So I brought a lot, I brought a lot of that to the girls. So that's why I became mother to a lot of the lesbians and a lot of the strippers. They called me mother because I helped them out in a lot of ways than one, so. Hi, I'm Hannah Congdon and I'm here talking with Leela Weinraub about her new documentary, Shakedown. Hi, welcome to the Berlinale. Hey. Thank you for talking to us. Um, so, for the film, you, from what I understand, you shot 300 hours of footage and you were shooting in the club from, I think, over 10 years ago, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, that is a huge amount of footage. How did you even begin to start cutting it down and how did you get involved with the club in the first place? Um, well, which one first? You decide. <laughs> how do you decide? on what makes it into a film, it's extremely difficult. It takes forever. I think that's like the longest part, mm. um, is actually like reverse engineering a story from footage, you know? And I think that the material dictates the narrative. And so I just tried to like be true to the performances. And, um, you know, really it's like a feeling. So you just like sort through the material and. Feel it out. <laughs> yeah. And um, I got involved originally with the club in a really like natural way. I just went there. Someone gave me a flyer and I found out about it and um, I went and I was like, um, you know, wanted to work there. <laughs> yeah. So I. And how old were you when that was? You, don't, you know, I think I was like 23, probably. So the film is kind of like a look back. And in the film, um, so we introduced to a number of characters, one of them is Egypt. And one of the things I found really interesting was um, when sh she talks about when she was younger, actually being almost homophobic mm -hmm. and not really being aware of any kind of queer issues. And it was actually through the club and the th right. through the club night that she almost discovered her sexuality. Uh -huh. um, how important do you think the queer club spaces are in order to create that visibility um, for queer people? Um, I think she said she know, knew about queer issues. She knew about it. She just didn't identify that way. Mm. And um, I think that there is, how do I, what do I, what did you ask me? So what, how, how do club spaces create um, a visibility for queer issues and, and queer people um, that helps them, yeah, kind of discover their well, own? Well, I'm not into that whole born gay thing. Mm. I think that that's like um, uh, puritanical, something that comes from the church, you yeah. know? And I think it's like a way to talk about being gay that is like protective. It's like, please don't hurt me. I wasn't, I was born this way, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's true. I think people choose, can, can have the ability to choose to be gay mm -hmm. um, and have like autonomy over their own sexuality. And um, so I think that like when you are in the world actively looking for who your people are, um, it's like a nightclub traditionally has been this like awesome space 
where like you can find your people you know I mean yeah. I found a lot of my people at night cool um and the within the film I can't remember who it is but someone says that they hate the word stripper it is what we traditionally see as a strip club but why why is there that discomfort with the word stripper and and what is the what does this particular club do differently so like changing the gaze from like a male and often white gaze to maybe a celebration of um, black queer sexuality. Yeah, I think that was actually in an edit that is not in the film anymore. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you might have access to an old edit. I think what that person was talking about was that, um, you know, people put a lot of negative connotations on the word and uh, it just seems like oversimplified. So she was like, um, I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that like, um, I don't know, it's just not even really comparable to other spaces. It's just like its own thing, you know? I think mm -hmm. that like people that strip in other spaces have their own story too, you know? It's just totally different, you know? Yeah. Do you think it would become objectifying if the audience changed? So, for example, if you did have a lot of white guys... I think that part of attraction is objectification. I don't yeah. think that being objectified is inherently negative. It's just okay. the, uh, the person that is doing the objectifying, or what's their intention, or are they, is it subjective objectification? Yeah. I think it's part of att attraction, Yeah. you know? And, um, I think that like a lot of people have done it wrong for a long time, yeah. but there are other ways to like be, you know. And I think that the film offers that. Yeah. And people talk about shakedown being rawness. I think that was one of the adjectives used to describe it. But there's also quite a few of the um, individuals who talk about their performance and kind of being a fantasy. How do you? How or how does the club night itself bring together that idea of rawness but also performativity? Um. Yeah, um, I think it's a vibe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's a vibe. I think that... I don't even... Uh, yeah. I think it's a vibe. Those aren't the words that I would use. Um, what words would you use? I would say... Like... Choreographed. Okay. You know? I would say... Um, evolved, or I'd say like originating, or yeah. Okay, and so much of the footage is kind of shot on VHS type film. It's actually shot on SD. SD. Okay, yeah. but um, it's like a prosumer camera. Okay, that so that was, was just like, something that you had with, on you the whole time. Yeah, it was like the camera that was like affordable, kind of, for people that wanted to make uh, independent film at that time. Yeah. You know, so it was like eventually that technology changed pretty fast. But um, it was like the thing that was really, it was like the thing that I could get a hold of. There's um, archival footage um, from the club that was shot on VHS. That's the stuff that's like from the 90s, but I didn't shoot that. Okay. But what I found interesting was the way that um, it's kind of a whole collage of these different kinds of media. So there's the posters and um, flyers and everything right. combined in the footage and you also you're very present in the film so we yeah. hear you asking the questions and guiding the individuals being interviewed and we also see kind of bits that I don't know things going a bit wrong in the interviews or things not being completely polished yeah why did you want that kind of unpolished effect well I think that's what you'd call raw okay <laughs> Um, I think that that's verte. It's actually what happened in the room, you know. Mm. I think it illuminates the process. There was like very simple, you know. There was like, it was most of the time it was just me shooting, and then for a few setup interviews, I would shoot with like one or two other people, like a second camera and sound. Mm. And um, it was like not like you know how maybe like even as set up as this shoot, you know, there was like no lights or lighting. and It was really like meant to be um, important. The questions were really important. There are things that I like thought about for um, 
I put a lot of energy into the like, or you know, I just was excited to interview people, you know, and the um, question and answer process seemed like really important and in a lot of ways like really central to the building of the narrative of the film, you know. I think that the film itself hopefully evolves in this like way that feels naturalistic, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's like informed by like the these like what I think are really important conversations about labor, you know, and taking, like, people's work very seriously. And, um, like, really, like, kind of, like, focusing on, like, what they do and how they feel about what they do, you know, and coming at it from, like, my own kind of, like, coming at the interviews from, like, a, um, a place, you know. So in my place was, like, about specifically about American labor, I think, you know. So, for example, in that final scene when you, I think it's Egypt, you asked to read out um, a particular statement yeah. towards the end. Had you decided beforehand you were going to film her reading out multiple times and you kind of giving her advice, or was that that just happened and then you decided afterwards, okay, I want to include all of this? Yeah, it was... Uh, it was a voiceover session. Okay. In the beginning of the film, there's like a little bit of a list of scenes, you know, that's mm. the beginning of the film, and then it kind of like lays out what each scene is called. And then that scene is called um, Egypt. It's actually called LW, which is my initials, and Egypt um, voiceover session. <laughs> Um, and so you were there on um, the final night, and in the film we see this build up to the final night, so, night, so increasingly more um, police involvement in the night. And there's a particularly distressing scene where um, Angel is handcuffed. Um, Jasmine, yeah. Oh, Jasmine, sorry, is handcuffed um, when she's completely naked. Uh -huh. How difficult was that actually being there? Um, and also, how difficult did you find it to film that at the time? Um, difficult, I don't think it's the word. Okay. I think that, um, it was important to keep the camera on. Yeah. yeah. And what was the atmosphere on that final night when you were there? Anticlimactic. Yeah? Yeah. I think that there's like, um, there was like, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that that's what the film tries to portray. I don't know if I could say it in any more words. Yeah, no, I just wondered if you had a particular personal feeling that was in any way different. Um, there were so many different emotions going on at the time, and even like for myself, I was like, is this real, is it not real, is it the end, is it not the end? I think that like, when something really traumatic happens, and like something that's like really growing and beautiful, and a bubble is burst, you know? Um, and, like, it's really hard to recognize that something is coming to an end, you know? Mm. I think that it's like, um, First of all, it's hard to realize that you're in a special moment when it's happening. I think that, like, there is not... I mean, I think there could be a lot more attention culturally paid to protection, yeah. <laughs> you know, and keeping things that are kind of, like, nice, just leaving them alone, yeah. you know? Because why do you think, it, why do you think a, a night celebrating kind of black female sexuality, like, why is that such a threat to authority figures like the police, like... Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that that gets to the root of like, what's the job of police? You know, what? Why do police exist in the first place? You know, and who they? Who do they exist for? Who are they serving? And who are their targets or objects? Yeah. And. How much did you feel like the night itself actually, how much was that a part of you? Because there's a lot of talk about family and mahogany is often referred to as like a mother figure. Yeah. How much did it mean to you in your own personal development? Huge. I think that like, um, 
there is like your born family and your chosen family, you know? And I think that both of them change a lot over your lifetime. I mean, that's been my personal experience, you know? Um, and the like cool thing about your chosen family is you get to choose, you know? And you get to decide like who is like in your world and it's very different from, um, you know, <laughs> the experience with your biological parents that you don't get to choose, you know? So it's kind of like this process of um, becoming an adult, you know, is like choosing people in your life um, and like, you know, yeah, growing. And have all of the people that you, you worked with and who were kind of your chosen family, have they seen the film and how did they find it? If they did. Um... The thing is, they've seen it for a long time. <laughs> They're like, my people that are close to me are very like important to the process, you know, and have been there every step of the way and just like have been really supportive. And then also just like really like um, been chill with me about um, time. I think that people are, are very often in a rush to publish anything all the time. You know, there's like a, a lot of media out there mm -hmm. and I wanted to make sure that I was making like cinema and not media yeah. and the distinction between that is um, I think that like media to me is like really about like people talking to each other there's immediacy in it it's like really important for news you know and information and then there's something that's like the realm or genre of cinema where it maybe can work with your imagination a little bit longer maybe it's like something where you see it and you maybe don't know what you think about it for a couple days you know yeah. and I hope that it's working on those kind of levels yeah and just my final question is, when you started doing this filming, you, you presumably didn't know that the club was gonna, the club night was gonna end in yeah. a few years' time. Um, how did the significance of what you were doing shift after the closure of the club, and essentially you it, you transitioned from just filming on the night to actually producing archive footage of that night? How did that shift what it meant to you? I guess it's more shifting now as like the public sees it. I continued to like film people that were part of Shakedown for many years after that incident with the police and like continue on what was important, to, like an important storyline to me, which is about the, these like two people who I thought were really dynamic and like their work and how that affects their family and how that evolves over time. You know, so I think that the police thing, yeah, I think that that audiences kind of like um, change the meaning of that. Like once it's seen by the outside world, then the meaning of that kind of changes. Yeah. And could it come back, Shakedown as a night? Or is Shakedown it... exists. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And can it come back? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for talking to us. Thank you.